Good morning, everyone. Welcome. You saw maybe on your chair or a chair next to you a gift. You get a gift this morning. You, all of you, can get a gift if you would like to have it. It is a Bible booklet for note-taking. We are starting a new series this morning going through the book of 1 Corinthians. And this is what we've done previously with other book series. Uh, it is a nice, easy, convenient way to take notes and uh, follow along with where we're going throughout the, the entire series. So it's yours for the keeping if you would like to use it. Uh, if you would like to give it to somebody else and gift it or re-gift it, as it were, then you can do that as well. So if you haven't already grabbed it yet and look at it, grab a copy and you could even begin to take notes today if you'd like. So most of the time, if you've been around here for a while, you probably know this. If you haven't, just let me kind of bring everybody up to speed here. Most of the time throughout the course of any given year, we take time on Sunday mornings to work through an entire book of the Bible. Uh, that way we do the content justice. We can take it all in within the context of the book or the letter or whatever the type of literature it is. Sometimes we take a break. We took a break with our blessed series and worked through a topic, but most of the time it's working through an entire book. So if you're new to us, uh, this, is, this is an ordinary thing that we're doing. And I'm excited to start a new series with you this morning. And I would like to pause for just a quick word of prayer as we begin something new, uh, I, would add, I want to ask the Lord's blessing on what it is that we interact with, with his word, and to seek his wisdom revealed in our hearts and our minds as we go forward. So if you'd pause and pray with me. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, I, I am so grateful for this opportunity to stand before your church. Uh, and at the same time, I ask, Lord, that as you give me this opportunity, and Danny, as we share from your word through this series, as we tremble, literally, before you and the, uh, the calling and the opportunity that we have, I ask, Lord, for the strength and the grace and the focus and the ability, Lord, to be true to the content and the, and the themes and the message of your word so that you would be honored and that nothing would be compromised. We pray, Lord, and we ask humbly for your blessing as we read your, your word, your truth, and interact with it. And Lord, I also pray that for all of us, whether we're here in person or listening online, that you would make our hearts and minds open and soft to receive, uh, quick to consider your truth, and eager, Lord, to respond to it. And in that way, we ask that you would be honored in what we do and how we do it and how we respond to 1 Corinthians over the coming weeks and months. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So, you see the screen, you see the title of the series, we're calling it The End of the World as We Know It. Now, uh, maybe already you're hearing an REM song from a few years ago bouncing around your head. That's fine, okay? We're not, we're not planning on singing it as part of uh, any kind of song set, so you don't have to worry about that. But it's, you hear that and you can't help but think of it. And, or possibly you're thinking of something kind of um, cataclysmic or Armageddon-like or apocalyptic when you, when you hear that. What I think of is that Will Smith movie, Independence Day, a few years ago. It's back in the 90s. And the first scene opens up with that song in the background. Anybody a fan of, this, of that movie? No, it's too long. Ah, okay, reluctantly you raise your hands. All right, it's a fun movie, right? Nothing better than blasting aliens and explosions and all that kind of senseless violence. So that song is the beginning of that movie. So we're not talking about the song. I'm going to stop talking about that. And it's not really Armageddon or Apocalypse. So you will understand, if I do my job, by the end of the message, you'll understand why in the world we would call this series from 1 Corinthians something like this, and why we would give it a title like this, because it actually does fit, and we're going to get there. So, I'm not assuming, you know, I mentioned 1 Corinthians, and where is that in the Bible? Well, it's in the New Testament, so if you go way towards the back, my Bible is bookmarked here, or marked here, so if I open it up. It's way towards the back of the New Testament. If you haven't found 1 Corinthians yet, if you have a Bible, you don't have a Bible, we've got Bibles to give away in the back. 
love to give them away. Uh, it will help because uh, as we go through this series, we'll have passages on the screen, but not every passage. Maybe you want to dig and read more. I highly encourage that. So we're towards the end of your Bible where the New Testament is. And not everybody knows what a Corinth is, okay? So I want to give you just a little bit of background as we begin our series that I think is important. I've got a map on there that I copied out of my study Bible. What you see on that map on the screen is basically most of modern-day Greece, okay? So it doesn't say that because it is a Bible map giving you names of places that don't exist anymore for the most part. But you do see some, some words that look familiar, right? Like Athens. Athens is still there. Ancient Corinth was 40 some miles away from Athens uh, as it exists. So you can see it there in that uh, block there. So the, the letter, 1 Corinthians is a letter, also a book in the New Testament. The letter uh, was sent to a group of believers in the city of Corinth in modern day Greece. The Apostle Paul lived there for about a year and a half and he made tents there to support himself. So that was his living. Maybe you've heard of tent-making ministries. People talk about that every once in a while. That comes from Paul and what he did when he was in Corinth. He made tents and sold them to support himself. Uh, it was his business. And along with his friends Priscilla and Aquila, they made tents and they shared Christ. They spoke of Christ, whether it was with believers or in the synagogue with Jews or out in the open in the forum. And if you want to know more about that, then you can go to the book of Acts. Now, why would you do that? Because the book of Acts, also in the New Testament, is short for Acts of the Apostles, or as some have said, it really should be Acts of the Holy Spirit, because it's the Holy Spirit that comes, that fills the believers, and fills the apostles, and things happen. But the book of Acts really is a, a concise history lesson of the beginning of the church. So if you turn to Acts chapter 18, you'll have more details about what happened with Paul and his friends in the city of Corinth. Corinth was an influential city at the time, politically, economically, and religiously. Paul points out later on here in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, there's many gods and there's many lords in uh, Corinth, which wouldn't be a surprise because regionally it was an important city, it was a large city, and there were temples there dedicated to different Roman and Greek, uh, from the past, Greek gods. So if you interacted at all with other people, especially economically, then you would be familiar with the gods of Corinth. There were temples dedicated to them, and as we'll discover as we go through 1 Corinthians, there were issues, at least one of the issues of the church had to do with meat that was sold in the marketplace that was part of originally a sacrifice to an ancient god in one of those temples in Corinth, which stirred up some problems in the church. Should we eat that meat or not? Because it's already kind of tainted by pagan influences and pagan religion, and should we do that? one of the many issues that they had to deal with. So, Paul lived there, stayed there for about a year and a half. After he left Corinth, he spent more time, two years or so, in another city called Ephesus. That's not on the map. It's over there to the right. I, I chopped it off. Sorry about that. But when Paul was living in Ephesus, he got a report from some people back in Corinth that things weren't going so great in their church. And that led to a number of different letters that were written to the church in Corinth. That is a little bit of a background of what's going on when we come to this, the very beginning of the letter slash book and what Paul is talking about and addressing to the people in this church. And he says this, Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father 
and the Lord Jesus Christ. A very typical ancient way to be in a letter, very typical for Paul to address a group of people in any of his books. So any of the letters that are attributed to Paul in the New Testament, you will see something very similar to what he says to the Corinthians here. One thing I want to point out in this address as he begins his letter, what does he call the church of God that is in Corinth? To those, what? Sanctified in Christ Jesus, he calls them what? Saints. Saints together with all those in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. These saints have some problems. And these problems or issues usually aren't associated with sainthood. Okay? When we hear saint, perhaps you or many people, I would think it's safe to say, uh, you hear the word saint and you attach to that somebody who's... Somebody who has a life that is above reproach, exemplary, doesn't sin, who has arrived at a different spiritual plane, right? He calls these people saints because of their relationship with Christ, not because they've arrived at any place. So I think it's important to point out, and it's important for Paul to begin with his letter because of the issues that he is about to dive into. They usually aren't associated with sainthood. Like the following. These are topics that Paul is addressing that he's heard about that are going on that he needs to address with them directly. And Paul, if you've read Paul, if you've read some of the letters uh, that he wrote in the New Testament, he doesn't beat around the bush. He's kind of a straightforward, straight shooting kind of guy. So uh, he wouldn't fit in so well in modern day Minnesota, honestly. He just wouldn't. And probably most churches in the upper Midwest. So he brings up directly the following divisions in the church. They're fighting, there's infighting going on because some people choose to say Paul's their leader and others say that other guys are their leader. So they're fighting over authority and prominence within the church. What else? Sexual immorality. There is something not only happening that's hush-hush behind the scenes. No, everybody knows about it. And it's being at least tolerated, if not more than that. So he addresses sexual immorality with his church and explains what the big deal is. Lawsuits. So people have disagreements within the church. Within the church. And instead of working on their problems directly with each other, they are going to the courts and suing each other instead of dealing with each other. Uh, the issues regarding, a number of issues regarding marriage and singleness, divorce and separation, a number of verses and chapters even are devoted to those issues. There's a confusion over idolatry. I mentioned the meat sacrifice to idols already. What do we do with that? And what if... What if there's somebody in the church uh, that says, well, I don't care, it's just meat, and I'm hungry, and i got to buy it somewhere, and others are saying, wait a second, I know where that came from, and I know the background of what happened as that animal was sacrificed to that whatever that pagan god was, I don't want anything to do with that other foreign religion because of who I am now in Christ. You could begin to see, can't you? Even though we don't understand all the details of, of life in Corinth, you could begin to see how that might be an issue and how people are getting along together or not getting along together. Uh, taking care of each other in the church, ministering to each other in the church. There are differences, all sorts of differences with background and spiritual giftedness. There are economic differences. Not everybody's on the same pay grade or pay scale. Uh, it really doesn't do justice to the history of the early church to think that everybody who came to Christ was poor or in, in a, some kind of impoverished situation. Uh, what we know and what scholars will say is people came to Christ from a wide variety of economic and financial situations. And now, for the first time in this brand new church, they're coming together, worshiping together, uh, celebrating the Lord's Supper together, well, at least sort of. Uh, maybe in their same room or the same house together, but they're not really together. So what we're finding with these issues and theological, doctrinal uncertainty, they're a new church, 
They've only learned so much so far. So as questions arise and who's in charge and who, is, who has the authority to speak into these things and, and really what do we believe about these issues, we're discovering that these really baby believers have baggage with them. Are you familiar with that terminology? They have come out of all sorts of backgrounds and belief systems and different uh, perspectives on life, all sorts of backgrounds, and they're, those bags, they're carrying them with them right into the church. And now what? <laughs> Plunk. Here we are. Here we are together. What do we do with all of those differences that tend to divide? And not only differences, I'll use the S word, sin. There are certainly things that are going on in the church that Paul calls out, not just as, well, differences and disagreements. No, you're sinning. You're sinning against God. You're sinning against other people. And that needs to be addressed, confronted, and dealt with within the church. So we don't just kind of ignore it. We don't say it's, ah, it's there. You push it under, you know. No, you address the elephant in the room, and that's what's going on here in the book of 1 Corinthians. So you look at that list, they had a lot of issues, and there's a lot of sin going on. But that's ancient times, right? Those aren't issues for us today, right? Of course, of course those are issues for everyone, for believers and for churches today. You look closely at that list. You don't have to look real closely at that list. (laughs) There are parallels. There are issues that are very similar, if not identical, that we struggle with. Some, at least, right? If you had to tell the truth, uh, there are problems that need to be dealt with. There are sins that need to be repented of, to be turned away from, not just pushed away, not ignored, or uh, we can agree to disagree. Uh, No, there are things that we need to figure out together. So there's different ways that we can approach a list like that that you see in front of you. You could say, Paul, Paul could address them that here's the wrong things, just quit doing them. (laughs) I identified the issues, now be more moral, be more right, uh, and and move on with your life and grow up. And sometimes, not just in Paul's day, but sometimes that's the way things are dealt with. Paul doesn't do that. If you read, and every time we start a new series, I always invite people to actually read the book on your own. Read it so you're familiar with it. Read it so you know, because you can anticipate even then what it is that we're going to talk about together. Read it, okay? Uh, You will see as you read it, Paul doesn't just slap on a moral response, uh, here's the band-aid to the hemorrhaging sin, and just go and be better people. He doesn't address problems like that, and we shouldn't either. We could, we could try to do that, but that would not do justice to what's really going on here, and it really wouldn't address things the way they need to be addressed. Paul addresses the issues listed, but he doesn't do the moral band-aid. He does this. As you read the book, and this is a challenging one, I'm going to tell you this. We, we have not gone on a series through a book like 1 Corinthians. I was nervous about Genesis. I think I've told a lot of people that before we went into that because I saw, you know, there could be div- divisive issues in Genesis and I avoided all those. Anyway, <laughs> but we, right. So we went through Genesis and we survived. The, 1 Corinthians is a whole nother ball game. If you've read it, you know that. If you haven't, you should and uh, gain a better understanding. But we have yet to go on a journey like this one. So just, I'm just throwing that out there. Uh, we need to be in prayer about this entire series and, and where 1 Corinthians takes us. Here's what Paul does. The beginning of the book, chapters 1 and 2, I have one cha- uh, chapter 1, verse 23 there, but we preach Christ crucified. The, the way he begins his argument, he begins talking about divisions. Uh, Danny's going to get us into the beginning of the book of the text next week. This is just kind of a big 30,000 foot view, okay, right now. He begins by saying, yep, there's all sorts of uh, things to divide on. 
people, different leaders, different emphases. And everybody in this world wants something different, uh, something that's uh, uh, powerful or convincing or seems wise by our own standards and so forth. Paul says simply this, we don't do any of that. What I do, what should be done, he establishes the beginning point of the discussion, Jesus died on a cross. That's where I begin to teach you, and that's how we begin to address the issues that are present in your church. And he goes on, all the way, fast forward to the end, or almost to the end of the book, chapter 15, and he says this as he's arguing about the resurrection. And if Christ has not been raised, chapter 15, verse 14, then what? Our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. It's pointless. We could talk about moral answers and absolutes and whatever, and just try to be better people. You don't need Jesus, and you sure don't need the resurrection for that. But we're not talking like that because that's pointless. He presses at the end of his argument the absolute necessity of the resurrection. If Jesus, yep, he died on the cross. We started preaching that. That's what we preach. He died on the cross. But if he doesn't walk out of that tomb three days later, this is all pointless. We're just playing religious games. But the fact that he did changes absolutely everything. And right in the middle of the book, as Paul is drilling down into some of those issues, he's addressing them directly. And there'll be parts of 1 Corinthians that are, that are a bit fuzzy to us still. Because intertwined in, in his address on these issues and sin are cultural things that aren't necessarily moral issues. So that's the, the fun part of Danny for Danny and I to dig through those details and to preach through them. But anyway, right in the middle of the book, he's drilling into those things. And Paul says this. He just kind of throws this out. And I was reading, I was studying the book over and over. This verse just popped and smacked me in the face over and over again. Because just briefly, he says, in the middle of that discussion, for the present form of this world is passing away. What you, the baggage you brought into this church, the way that you've understood things, your approach to life, okay? Are you, are you with me so far? What it is that you thought meant everything to you, that is part of the world that is done to you, believer. The way that you live, everything that defined you is over. And all of that world system is passing away because why? There's an empty tomb. That changes everything. What is it passing away to? In light of all those struggles and all those issues, we see, we have a lens, we can see through a lens of the gospel. Because Jesus lives, there is good news, we see all of those issues through his lens, and now we can begin to understand ourselves better and what needs to be changed, and we can begin to understand and address issues with each other not just more morally, but in a way that truly is renewed by the gospel. Are you following me? That's the overarching idea with 1 Corinthians. Without that, all we have is moralism or legalism. With that, we can begin to see and understand the absolutely revolutionary idea that comes with the knowledge of the transformation of our lives in Jesus Christ as he establishes his kingdom, his rule, his order in my life, then I'm seeing and understanding things differently. And as this kingdom comes out of me, I understand you and our relationship, our, our relationship with each other differently. And then it keeps on transforming, changing the world around us until someday his kingdom is fully realized and Jesus comes back and the kingdom of, our, of this world becomes a kingdom, how does Revelation say it, of our Lord and of Jesus Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Now, we all wish that would happen instantly, but he doesn't do it like that. He comes to meet us where we're at 
in the rough and messy areas of 1 Corinthians, addresses those and begins to change us. That's where this book goes. And that's not just ancient stuff. That's real-time us stuff. Without that understanding, the present form of this world is passing away in order to give way to Jesus. Without that, we're, we're in trouble. So those issues in Corinth become issues, yep, they're, they're still around. They're not just ancient things. They're things that we need to be aware of and can be radically transformed by the renewing of our hearts and our minds. Tim Keller, in one of his sermons, put it this way, the issue on which everything hangs, everything hangs, is not whether or not you like Jesus' teaching, but whether or not he rose from the dead. If you believe it, if you look at that tomb and say it's empty, then you are willing to say, not only does that transform my faith, but it transforms the way I see you and you see me. Now, I got one more quote here. It's one thing, huh, it's one thing to acknowledge, yep, I personally, I need more work. And I need to be humbled under the reign of Christ in me. That's one thing, and that's hard enough. It's another thing to be humble enough and be changed enough under the authority of Christ to see you differently and our relationship differently. You, brothers and sisters, aren't somebody, something else I consume. That you're there to better me right now. Uh uh. Not under the reign of Christ. I look at you in a revolutionary way. There is this awesome sermon that C.S. Lewis, Lewis delivered, I believe it was in 1941. It's called The Weight of Glory. And uh, maybe you've heard the quote, but I, 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 it kept bouncing around my head. I went back and I found it. And it has to do, in this sermon, it has to do with how do we look at each other? He says this, it is a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses. To remember that the dullest, most uninteresting person you can talk to may one day be a creature which if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship. Or else, a horror and a corruption such as you now meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. All day long we are, in some degree, helping each other to one or the other of these destinations. There are no ordinary people you have never talked to a mere mortal. He was a master of the English language. The way that he communicated just makes you stop, doesn't it? It's true. Our souls go on. Our lives don't end. It's, the question is the destination. As we interact with each other, please keep in mind, no one is an ordinary person here. There are no mere mortals what we are a part of is the body of Christ. And we will see that transforming message come out of 1 Corinthians. Just the absolute significance of who we are in Jesus and the absolute necessity of seeing each other differently. We are all headed to some place that is beyond this grave that awaits where is it? Do we love past our divisions? Do we love people to the point where we, we know we see them differently and we want them to be transformed by Christ? We want to treat them in such a loving way that they are set apart. If, if we set uh, that goal before us, before our church, oh, God will be praised. And the things that tend to divide us will be minimized. They will shrink through that gospel lens that changes everything. No mere mortals in this place. Can we make that a slogan? Possibly. No mere mortals. There are no ordinary people. How are we helping others and leading them on to a destination that is glorious? I want that for us. And I want that to guide our thinking as we go through 1 Corinthians. Now, 
because of those issues, because of those, the, the themes that are developed in this book. Another challenge for Danny and I is how do we preach through this in a timely way uh, and not lose the forest for the trees? Because that's one option. We could go on for the next two, three years. No one wants that, pretty sure. Because you lose the forest for the trees, right? Whoa, what's happening? But you cannot be, with these issues, we cannot be flippant in the way that we deal with them. They're too big, and they are too potentially divisive. So we've got to honor the Word of God and give careful attention to these topics. So we'll do our best to pace it in such a way that you're understanding that we're gaining something, but there will... I'm just absolutely certain of this. There will be times with it where you're going, huh? Why didn't he answer this question? Or what about this scenario? Or I'm still struggling? Or whatever it is. There, it's an absolute guarantee we're going to have moments like that. Because we just can't drill deep enough for all of us at any moment. The connect card that Danny mentioned earlier. Now we have one more reason for that card. I mean, you can always email and text, and that's fine. But if it hits you in the moment, yeah, why didn't he answer, or what is he talking about? Or whatever, whatever your question is, write it down before you leave and drop it in that box with anything else you may be interested in writing down. But write the questions down that will enable us to be all the more effective as we, as we preach through this series. And maybe, we've already talked about this, maybe there are going to be some moments or some times where the question is so big and a number of people have a sim the similar question that we need to take extra time apart from Sunday morning to drill deeper. Uh, and it, certainly, I, we would love to do that. Uh, maybe in a Sunday night or whatever and have a little special time where we, we lay out the Word of God and we have more of a Bible study to the sermon and give you time, uh, plenty of time, everybody, plenty of time for Q&A and we can talk through things, okay? I really want to do justice to what's going on here in this, in, in, through all these themes and to involve all of us in practical ways that will be helpful for our body. So you've all heard that, right? Maybe you already have a question because you know what's coming. <laughs> I've, given, I've given you some idea, but maybe there's another part of the book. You know what's coming and you want to make sure that we don't go over too quickly. Write it down and we'll do our best to answer that in a way that uh, it is appropriate and helpful for everyone. So with that in mind, let's pray and close up our, our message here. We are reminded, Lord, this morning that you came out of love to save sinful people who are dead and unresponsive. And through your life, we can also live and find new life in you. As we've sung already this morning, we've praised you for what you've done for us. Lord, enable us as we move forward in this series to understand better what it is that you have for us personally. Humble us under the truth and authority of your word so that we would respond to it. And Lord, whatever you'd have for us as a church, enable us, Lord, to respond in a way that would honor you and move us forward in a healthy way as a church. We are so grateful that the world in its present form is passing away. And we stand confidently knowing that the tomb is empty. And praise God, we do have promises that will never fail. Lord, we are grateful for how you love us and how you've set us free. Enable us to respond in a way that will honor you in the highest possible way. We are not surrounded by ordinary people. We are surrounded by children of God set free for the purpose and the work of your spirit in this place. Enable us, Lord, to see a new world, a new reality that you put before us and to live in it. In Jesus' name, amen.